This week, I saw two pretty good movies and one very not good movie, and we are going to talk about it all. Plus, those big TV shows everybody is loving right now might have hit some interesting new peaks, so we are getting into that too. Welcome back to Comic Book Nation Season 6, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and with me today are my co-hosts, Matthew Aguilar and Janelle Wheeler. What's up, guys? Hello, hello. (laughs) All right, let's get back into it. We're deep in the season now, and uh, we're kind of just in the middle of things in terms of big TV shows that we've been discussing. We've got some new media to talk about we got some news and we got a trailer we got a breakdown for a very different kind of transformers movie but up first as i kind of teased and as this title just spoils to this video it's probably down um yeah we got to talk about i saw there's a lot of new movies out this week there's two big theatrical movies and a big streaming movie two of those movies were pretty good and one of them was very much not enjoyed by me Let's get into it. Starting up off the top, let's go to the one that uh, I think is generating the most buzz early as we uh, get on to this thing. It is Rebel Moon Part 2, The Scar. Zack Snyder's uh, second installment of his Rebel Moon universe, the sci-fi universe he has created. Um, you know, you can go back and listen to our Rebel Moon Part 1. We did a whole spoilers podcast on that. We talked about a lot of things. We got into the whole off-screen, on-screen politicking of both sides of it. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to be a lot more short and sweet this time around. We're not going on with all that. Um, I said right before the counter counted down to introduce our show that... uh. I'm going to write an article, so now I'm going to stick myself out there in the world and do that. But I think I'm going to write this article right after this, like, that just is called Zack Snyder Needs to Direct Video Games, which is how I feel now. Because, you know, this is not even a shot at gaming, but, like, I just feel like most of what I'm seeing from these Rebel Moon movies, and especially in this one, would be pretty awesome if I was in the middle of, like, a cutscene of a video game and then somebody gave back the gameplay to me and let me take over from there and get into the character myself and fill it in and and get into the action of it and make it badass for myself. I think that'd be great. He's great at the setup for that, like in the visuals for that, but like, yeah, to just, there's just no connection. And as you know, our regular YouTube commenter, because this is the live show, if you're listening on audio, uh, this is our Friday live show where we get to kind of do it with all our fans. And, you know, we love to do that. So join in every Friday. Um, Yeah, man, it is so weird to get so much, quote unquote, epic death, destruction, sacrifice in all of this from this kind of Seven Samurai knockoff movie and feel absolutely nothing. Like, I don't know about you guys. I'm speaking for myself. It's just I feel nothing. I feel nothing. It was Rebel Moon Part One kind of left me cold and I was like, okay. But I was like, I'm a big Snyder fan. Let's just preface this. I'm the biggest Snyder fan now looking like now soon to be sliding into a new term apologist. It feels like, Um, you know, up here and I put myself out here. But um, yeah, I I wasn't I wasn't tricking myself into thinking I loved Rebel Moon Part One, but I had hope. I was like, maybe this will all land in part two and it'll come. It don't land in part two, man. Like part two is. After seeing Dune Part 2, let's just put it this way. After seeing Dune Part 2, right? Another movie we had problems with in Part 1. Didn't necessarily connect with a lot of people. After seeing the jump from Dune 1 to Dune 2, this ain't no Dune 2. Like, it's just... This might be the worst directed movie I've ever seen Snyder put out. Like, in terms of him behind the camera. In terms of just the shots. And, like, the crafting of it. Like, none of these shots felt right. Like, they weren't bad, per se, but they just didn't feel right. Like, in every moment, I didn't feel like I was connecting with a character. If there was a battle happening, I felt like I was getting the wrong view most of the time. Or it was just silly, the stuff. This seems like somebody... This feels like AI created a Snyder film based on trolling things from Twitter, right? Like, the slow-mo scenes are just (laughs) even weirder and just dumber than ever. Like... 
no AI purpose to it. Like, <laughs> and like, yeah, it, it just, it, it feels like everybody who's ever like kind of has been making fun of Snyder got together and made like their own kind of satire fanfic of it. And this would be it. But we all know that this, that's not the case. Matt's just sipping his tea over there. And like, in that, you know, he put this out and it's just like, none of this has felt serious to me. It feels unserious. Like, I don't feel any soul in this anywhere. Like, usually you feel like a director has a piece of themselves in this film and the story. There's there's soul in it, right? This feels like somebody got a lot of money and was like, you know what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to pew pew like this and like that and do this and like and like and just do that and kind of very I think people have used the word I've seen self-indulgent and that feels oh. like we are hitting not just the self-indulgent point of a director but like almost a point where like fandom kind of like hip-hop in a weird way we keep coming back to hip-hop but like hip-hop in a weird way has gotten to be this parody of itself where like every new rapper is just like uh, it's just like code words. It's like, oh, I got this new gun, plus these new drugs, plus this new car, plus this new fashion. <laughs> I'm a hip hop star. And you can do that for any genre of music today, really. We could go <laughs> around the bend, but you know what I mean? Like, and it, and it feels like this movie is like the ultimate geek fandom movie because we got laser swords, cybernetic hands, steampunk, anime, plus we got some Kurosawa stuff. And, and it's just like, okay, but... <laughs> just by putting these things on screen does not make them cool, right? He's like really Anthony cool. Hobbins' mecha robot does not make it cool just because he's there. Um, There's nothing okay, don't to Don't besmirch the name of Jimmy. Don't besmirch Jimmy. All is right. that even you his name? That is that his name? Was his yes! Name. They're Jimmy's! They're Jimmy's! They're robots! Okay, just okay, because... I was just testing, was just testing to see if you really knew. Because I was like, I don't know if people even really know. So I was just testing. Ah, but you knew. Lord. You got you. You got me. But uh, I, I, I could. I feel like I'm starting to get to be a, like this black hole of negativity. You guys take over, because so at least the blame is shared. You know. Well, Matt, so now, like, oh, no, do you want I me really, to go? Well, I'm leaning really heavily on you guys here because of my lack of Star Wars knowledge, and I'm. I feel really stupid that I kind of enjoyed this. <laughs> like, I'm like, don't feel I, stupid. <laughs> am I watching this wrong? Like, what am no. I doing? No, I, do, hey, no. do not, do not let me gaslight you in any kind of way. No, Go off, you're not. tell me what you I thought. Just, but every point that you're making, Kofi, is so valid that it's like. I'm kind of that naive viewer that when I watch it, I'm like, oh, Zach, the Zack Snyderness of it. And I love the slow motion shots and this is so pretty. And um, and then when you make these points on the podcast, I'm like, oh, crap, he was right about that. Oh, no, he was right about that. Too. Oh, I didn't even think about that. And so now I'm really curious what Matt thought about it. <laughs> okay, so so I've been, it was, it was pretty much a complete genre flip when, part one hit because me and me and Kofi are often on opposite sides when it comes yeah. to Zack Snyder projects uh we have because my thing is all of these points are you could have said about any of his movies <laughs> those are my some of my biggest issues with his DC films uh but but here's the thing without some of those things attached right because my my issue with him was always um in those previous projects of like taking on too much in a in a very like small amount of time you know my, my my biggest thing with batman v superman right is is not ben affleck as batman or henry cavill superman or even some of the shots that are in there because they're amazing it's the fact that you tried to fit three iconic storylines into a two and a half hour film and then thought you know was surprised when it like blew back on you i was like i i didn't understand that right so like it was just from planning this i don't have that attachment to right because it's not batman it's not tied to some iconic trinity thing right it's a it is a smorgasbord of things we love in geek culture it really is it is like one of those 80s adventure cartoons come to life in Zack snyder's hands so you have laser swords you have all the pew pews you have all that stuff because all of that is correct and i came away from one though seeing the flaws it has flaws absolutely uh but but i really dug it i was in i was like I, i'm into this you know like 
samurai classic story we've seen over and over again but but i'm in because of the mix of tech and the mix of the characters that i actually really dug and all that stuff so when snyder pitched two part two as a hey that was a setup for the team and then here's a war movie that's what this is and it's a balls to the wall war movie as far as like there is a ton of action the action here i mean there's some stuff that just like i just loved I, I just thought it looked so cool. Uh, a Jimmy right there. Now, there's not enough Jimmy. There is not. There should be way more. And that's my biggest issue with the movie is that, and I cannot believe I'm saying this in 2024. Uh, I really want to see the director's cut. <laughs> I really want to see both. And I cannot believe I'm saying that. But I want to see the extra hour of content plugged in on each one of these because my biggest issue with this is that certain characters titus rules in this he gets moments there's several characters that get their moments but then there's like half the team that doesn't and i felt like oh my like you you know crazily enough you either needed to rein something else in i don't really know where that is i guess some of the history stuff i still have my issues with the 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 big villain of this i never felt delivered that's my my other big issue is that i still feel underwhelmed by the big bad that never i never felt like oh yeah that's a real that's thanos that i never got that vibe i just was like that that villain just you know ed screen's villain to me is the central part of this he's the villain that like oh my god he's He's cool. He's threatened, whatever. The one that's above him that's supposed to be the big bad could care less. Like that, that would never resonate for me. But but as far as just the stuff that's on the ground moving, we're constantly moving. There's a ton of action. I dug it. It's fun. I there's some stuff that's underbaked, but I feel like it's just because I I needed more time with those characters. It should not take you, is my big other big issue with Snyder. It should not take you four hours to do that though so <laughs> he should have been able to do it in two and a half three like tons of other directors do i still have an issue with that but there is a part of me that like i want to see the director's cut i want to see the r rating i want to see the extra footage and see if all of that does come together as it stands now i had fun it has flaws it has a couple big flaws for me but i had fun and i still really dig this universe and I can't you know, believe I'm saying you know that. what you know what I love about this show is that I always think I know I'm coming in here with like two old friends that I'm rock solid and I'm gonna come in here and be like, oh yeah, I drop it a paint and both of you are always oh, no. like we do not feel that way. And I'm like, we have oh, disappointed man. Oh, man. <laughs> or no, I'm not disappointed. It's just it always keeps me on my toes that I never really know how you guys are gonna feel about something. Every time I think I know, it, I always get surprised. All right, so I'm the I'm lone so man grateful, out. Matt. I'm grateful that you said that. And like I I know that I'm not the Star Wars expert, so I won't make it really long, but like I did for for what it was, which is not like a must see programming event for me. I still enjoyed it very much. Like I'm visiting my family and I'm literally like glued to my phone, like trying to watch this. I will say this, though. I, I was cramming trying to get through it before the podcast started because I really wanted to make sure I saw it in full. Um and so I was skipping a lot of the wheat field moments, like the slow motion. <laughs> I was like, 10 seconds, skip, 10 seconds, skip, you know. Um, and so I didn't get that. I, I guess it probably didn't drag on as much because I literally was like fast forwarding through certain moments. Um, but I'm going to have to watch this again with my husband. So I'll, you know, obviously weigh in if anybody wants to chat at me, holler on Twitter or something. Um, but I, I love the robot guy. I love him so much. Um, and the way they left this off, obviously we're not going to spoil this for you guys, but the way they left this off, I, I would imagine they're going to keep going with it. Am I right? Like it, it feels like they're trying I mean, they to they set that. it up there I, for I a big two no. act thing. Yeah. Before, yeah. before I came on this podcast, I would have said absolutely probably not, but it seems <laughs> like. <laughs> maybe so maybe Zack Snyder's not as crazy when he's saying people are watching this more than Barbie or something like that like no definitely not more true. than Barbie Bar Barbie yeah, is no my way. heart 
that, I hey man, so we've watched are... Barbie like five times since it hit oh, on demand. Cute. Well, so that's, I will say I did, I, Kofi, like, I love your point about not feeling emotionally charged towards any character because that is such a, an important thing for me. I am so attached to like character development and I would prefer a slow film to actually fall in love with the characters than even like an action packed. I know I'm kind of alone in that in the superhero vein of things. Um, and you're right. Like I did not feel emotionally attached to anyone um, except for like one person that we lost. And I did actually shed a tear. Now I'm hormonal because I am like seven months pregnant. So it <laughs> might just be because of that. But I did feel like a little, a little bit of emotion at the end. No, it's and okay. So, you know, like I got, and I'm curious if anybody else who has watched it or who is going to watch it, I'm so curious if you guys felt emotional about that moment too. So please let me know so that I can gauge my own like mentals. Like, am I, am I stable here or am I like just pre like pregnancy brain? I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I actually really liked it enough to watch it again with my husband, which I know is like crazy for some of y'all, but I also love Zack Snyder. Like I messaged the the guys last night and I was like, Hey, did we get screeners on this? Because like I wanted to sit down with my family and watch it all together, and um, and I was like, dang it, I, you know, we're such big Zack Snyder fans, we should totally get screeners. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I'm also I'm I'm a Zack Snyder fan as well. So I'm kind of I don't know. I feel like I'm both of you at this point. I don't know. Man, now it I'm is. Feeling, I feel, I'm confused. <laughs> it's uh, it's wild that you guys will love this, but I cannot pull you into watching more anime. That is, it is wild. <laughs> I have watched more anime. Yeah, I, I'll you know, try. I mean, uh, Kofi, I'll do it for you. I'm gonna be sitting around a lot. I'll do it. I, I can do it for you. Hey, listen, to Anime <laughs> Initiative on Comic Book Nation feeds. Uh, they'll they'll steer <laughs> you guys right. They'll steer you guys right every time. All right. We've done a lot. That's Rebel Moon Part Two: The Scar Giver. Uh, Janelle and Matt, you guys will give it thumbs up, thumbs down. Can I go like this? <laughs> okay, Janelle's in the middle. One, Matt's thumbs up. One I'm up, thumbs one down. down. Yeah. So we yeah. got one up, one down, one in the middle. So in other words, <laughs> it's a Zack Snyder movie. All right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Here we go. Yes. Here we go. Let's move on. All right. So moving right <laughs> along to the horror vein, just some quick other updates on movies this week that are opening. Um, we have Abigail that's opening in theaters. I got to check that out. Abigail is the new film from Radio Silence, the team that did um, Scream 5, Scream 6, and Ready or Not, plus the VH, VHS movies. Uh, that's mm -hmm. Matt B Bettinelli Olpin and Tyler G Gillette or Gillette. Um, and Abigail is this kind of I gave it 3.5 out of 5 for comicbook.com. You can read <coughs> my review on comic book horror. Excuse me. And it's about kind of this weird mashup of a crime heist film, a comedy, a gross out horror, and a vampire flick. And it takes this group of cooks who abduct this little girl for of a powerful person and are supposed to hold her for a night for ransom. But it turns out this little girl is not just a little girl. She is a much older vampire and they are actually locked in a safe house with her as kind of her little feeding game. So um, amazing this, premise. Oh, it is an amazing premise. <laughs> and I love this movie because, you know, Radio Silence is quickly making. And as I say in the review, making the argument for being some of the top horror filmmakers in the genre right now. Um, everything they've done after VHS has been either a, has been a steady cult hit with Scream 6 becoming like a legitimate hit um, and people just more importantly, just always sitting up and taking notice and being like, whoa, what is this? Like, and they got eyes for spotting talent and, and putting talent out there from Samara Weaving and Ready or Not to Melissa Barrera, who they've worked with in Scream 5, 6 and now this. Um, and yeah, the kind of blend of genres that goes on in this is so weird but it works so well and the cast is another big part of why it works you've got a cast that has melissa barrera dan stevens uh catherine newton from ant-man and the wasp uh, quantum mania kevin durant you know who's the blob and in the uh, horror film legion and in the tv series the strain giancarlo s G giancarlo esposito from breaking bad uh angus cloud the late angus cloud from euphoria and 
couple surprise appearances here and there. But um, this cast, like, I mean, they cook. Half of this movie is these people trying to remain anonymous, these crooks. They all get names from the Rat Pack, like Joey, Sammy, you know, he, like all this, Frank. And all of them together, it's great. They have wit. They have banter. Um, Dan Stevens and Melissa Barrera as the two leads are just freaking fantastic because of their whole thing with each other. Um, and, yeah, the girl who plays Abigail, Alicia Weir, who played... Um, Oh, she was in Matilda in that Matilda musical movie. Um, you know, she is a young star rising and the stuff she has to do here is more than like, you know, we give Linda Blair and like people, young horror actors or actresses, like a lot of credit, but like this girl has to do it all in this movie. She has to play innocent, has to play freaky. She has to do like some fighting and stunts and, and all kinds of stuff, some dance. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty around the bend. And, um, yeah, it's a good time. And Radio Silence, I think I said, just in, just to conclude in the review at one point, I'm like, at this point, you can know that if you hear it's Radio Silence, they have a big mansion, and there's an ensemble cast, like, guaranteed good times. Guaranteed good times. Um, you're 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 going to have a good time. And uh, Abigail is definitely a good time at a horror movie, while still being pretty brutal and and freaky uh, uh, for a good portion of it, so this is what I might see because I the premise is such so good that like I never go see horror movies, and this might be one of the few like I seek out because I just love the premise. Totally so agree. Much. Vampires, man, I love yeah. vampires. No, and this and there's even like funny references to like Twilight and what kind of vampire are we dealing with, and like yeah, oh it's gosh. a but it's like a classic good like scary kind of vampire things and there's some pretty neat vampire things and there's one classic line about kind of vampires in this that i i audibly laughed out loud when i heard it at like one point and it's it's great so uh, also yeah they they messed up i know there's we're not going to get into the off-screen controversy and all that but melissa barrera is that oh, is yeah. that final girl right now like she is that final girl of the horror genre right now and like y'all really messed up on that scream thing not bringing back this yeah. team of her in radio silence these they're clicking like i mean it's sick how well the, they're clicking and like yeah y'all messed up i mean no no shade at nev campbell and courtney cox and them i always love og scream but like this this was the proof like everybody kind of was morbidly curious to see like oh you know, after that stuff with Melissa Barrera, do you know, will this film also would she even be able to like deliver in this? Like, yeah, she plays a completely different character and is awesome in this film as well. So, oof, that gets messy. But before we get too off that cliff, let's go to one more film. Um, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, the new Guy Ritchie film, which is out in theaters, uh, was reviewed by comicbook.com critic Patrick Kavanaugh who gave it, I believe, a 2 or 2.5 out of 5 star Whoa. review. Um, and this is a rare kind of case where I'm going to quickly just say that, like, you know, I always respect, we always respect our fellow comicbook.com writers here, obviously, oh, yeah. but um, I disagree with that one. Um, I would also give it equally, like, a 3 to 3.5 score out of 5. Um, this is a movie where Guy Ritchie kind of, it, it it's this weird mix of Guy Ritchie where you can see where he's grown from like into a, an Aladdin director, but where he still has that lock stocks, two smoking barrels and snatch kind of underworld saga edge to him. Thank you for the high production. That was very dramatic. I loved it. Um, and it's a story of kind of this, the, the formation of, of, you know, the special ops unit of the UK and the SAE, which became the SAE, I believe. And it, it's about the mission they went on to at the, at the pivotal point in world war ii to stop hitler's u-boat kind of dominance of the seas which was keeping us the u.s out of the war and if it's all fun i've done too much world war ii history this is getting boring but the point is this was a special ops group and so it's like kind of one part guy Ritchie movie a little inglorious bastards and a little bit of history right um now people have had a lot of issues and I think Patrick kind of pointed out that this movie doesn't know what it wants to be just kind of slick fantasy about how these guys about larger than life people that were almost like superheroes and, and this or kind of historical nail biter thriller to show you how close it came in world war two. And it's, and it's true. They walk a line in that, 
But as I was saying to some other critics, because I had to see this and Abigail back to back when we were talking about this movie the next day, I was like, you know, while I was watching it, I realized I didn't want dramatic stakes. I did not want to be concerned or nervous in this movie. I, at no point did I want to feel like the Nazis might win, like this might not go well, like we could lose people. Like, And it's not doing that kind of thing. Like these are guys who like literally walk in the room and just lay everybody down. There's an awesome sequence of Alan Richardson's character, who's this crazy Swedish kind of murderer, just going through a boat with a bow and arrow and a hatchet. And just, I mean, it, it's crazy. Somebody's going to probably do a video about how many Nazis he kills in this sequence. Like, and it's just pure high fantasy about kind of World War II heroes. And yes, they're based on real people, but this is in no way a real movie. Um, but it was enjoyable in that way. It's a, again, an ensemble cast. That's really, really good. Henry Cavill as like basically Ian, the guy who inspired Ian Fleming's James Bond character, the real life kind of major who spent him. Alan Richardson, as I said, a big hulking crazed Swedish. So killer. glad he's getting that killer. do shine, man. Oh yeah. Eisen Gonzalez, who was just in three body problem is really great as a kind of femme fatale spy. Uh, Henry Golding as a bombs expert. Alex Pettifer, who I haven't seen in a long time since like the Magic Mike days, um, is really good as well. And just everybody in this. Babs, Olusa Mokin from uh, Dune and Star Trek, uh, Strange New Worlds as the doctor. And that is good. And even just smaller appearances from like Carrie, El Carrie Ells and other people are really good. So it's slick. It's fun and it's like arousing, like, yeah, let's beat the heads in of some really bad people type of movie. And so if, if you can like Inglorious Bastards, I think this is right up your alley. And if you like Guy Ritchie's early work, you know, right up your alley. So I'm kind check of that surprised. out. Too. I haven't seen any like advertisements for this anywhere. Was this I, I didn't even know this was out. It's like, been kind of like very select targeting. It's like on the okay. AMCs and sci-fi channels. Gotcha. Like they, they, okay. they've they been really targeting towards like fan because it has Richardson and Cavill and, you know, they're kind of. Yeah, going that, that makes sense. It. And if you know Star Trek, you know, Babs. And there's a lot of people that if you've been watching a lot of geekdom stuff in this, you'll you'll probably. Yeah. Recognize Dang. and check out. But um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird to market. You know, Guy Ritchie's kind of in such a different phase now that like yeah. it's kind of hard to go back and market this. But uh, it's a good time. It's a good time. I would, you know, what I haven't said this in a long time since probably before the pandemic. But it's a great matinee watch. I think like if you want to go and have a good matinee watch, this, this is sounds fun. True choice. All right, should we? Uh, what time is it? Let's yeah, we should take right? a break. Come back and then really get into what Matt's really here for talking about transformers one so we'll be right back All right, second half of Comic Book Nation. Let's talk about Matt's favorite thing that he saw this week. Take it away, buddy. Go ahead and cook. Ah, uh, well, we teased it up last show, and we were gonna get a. We got the first footage at CinemaCon for Transformers One. 
I was very hyped then. And then we finally got the big trailer rolled out with the with the poster and everything. If you don't remember, Transformers what 1 is, up, is Transformers a fans? prequel series that takes you back to when uh, before Optimus and Megatron uh, were actually named those things. They were Orion Pax and D-16. Uh, and we essentially see how they become those people as well as you know they're still on cybertron they don't even have the ability to transform and this trailer starts out with like a, i love how it actually goes from hems hemsworth and henry to like sitting next to each other to orion and and d16 sitting next to each other it just kind of fades naturally into there uh we we see this story play out also alita one plays a big role and then probably the kind of over mvp of the of the whole trailer b127 uh michael <laughs> <laughs> keegan michael key uh is amazing so we see this trailer you know they kind of promise this animation style uh between a like a pixar movie and like mutant mayhem and and it's kind of somewhere in between it and i i thought the animation looked pretty slick uh i i thought this was i've seen a lot of takes uh discussion on i know every transformers is always one of those things right uh that it's it has it's one of its like most iconic uh pieces of media entrenched in animation the first transformers animated movie is like a classic you it is an iconic thing uh in geekdom right so i know sometimes it's like everything gets compared to that and as someone who adores that movie uh i totally understand but i've seen some things about like the light-hearted nature of it and things like that and what was so cool about this is i view everything now through the prism of not just me but my me and my daughter and we watched this trailer together for the first time i hadn't seen it yet and I was like, hey, do you want to watch the Transformers trailer with me? And she was like, yeah, yeah. What, what, like, you know, and she knows what Transformers is very vaguely. Like, you know, they're the the cars that turn into robots. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. So she watched it with me and laughing at all the same spots. And like, she's like smiling throughout like, oh, that's cool. And like, we're, we're geeking out together. That is exactly what I'm looking for in a Transformers film right now. Because I already have the stuff that's like super adult like i really like the war for cybertron trilogy that rooster teeth did uh i really enjoy the original animated movie i like some of the other series i like the movies so like i feel like i have that part covered and i'm looking for something that enriches the lore and also is like a new entry point for new fans and this seems perfect as it's just see i was i was so happy by the end of this like the action looks slick the transformations i love that they're it's awkward they don't know how to do it so like all throughout the trailer you're seeing like <laughs> them like screw up and trying to transform for the first time uh, i love that alita one's getting some shine and and keegan michael key is going to run away with the movie dude already shines in every scene he's in the proto bumblebee <laughs> is is delightful i just i just thought this was great uh i'm really excited for this uh and this is yeah, coming off of yeah go the ahead trailer the trailer looks beautiful like it looks amazing you kind of convinced me <laughs> yeah i like and I, look i know i i gushed a lot over rise of the beasts uh we were very high on that movie i still am super high on that movie uh but uh but yeah i i came away just like so so happy uh kofi how do you feel well first of all shout out to eddie on youtube uh at team paramount my friend we do not have to choose between uh ninja turtles and transformers we get to enjoy both come join our mountain of entertainment um i wanted to hate the hell out of this when it first began i did i was like oh god what have they done to my transformers but by the end of this i was i was sold i was like oh man they got me um you know you have to let go of things and be willing to kind of welcome like new takes on your favorite things i'm a big believer in that because this is how we get some of the best stuff in fandom so i was just like just stop for a minute and just let this be its own thing it's obviously before megatron and optimus are megatron and optimus and as you said um as we went through it you know it's weird to hear brian tyree henry and chris hemworth chris hemsworth voices coming yeah. out of these iconic characters but like yeah it, it the whole premise got to me by the end of this trailer i was like i'm into this i'm into the transformers learning to be themselves learning kind of like what they can do and what their potential is and i already see how this story can get more serious and and actually have a serious point even though it's for kids which is like you know you might think you have a friend but people grow and people change in you know where you end up and how you see things may not uh, may not agree 
like by the end and and life is like that and you know i'm sure there's some corresponding lessons to go with it whether it's like you know don't have to hate your friend you gotta love them but know that you guys have changed or whatever it is um and you gotta go and be your own person and do what you gotta do like you know those are important lessons to learn so i can see where there is going to be something wrapped into this and it could be a powerful lesson right by the time these two have to split and you see Megatron and Optimus in a different way when you see them at odds with each other from here on out. Just never show your kids the original Transformers movie after this because that'll probably be next <laughs> up in the queue. You got to be yeah. there with the click off. Turn that off. Yeah. Because if they come back and see what we were living in in the cocaine 80s and they see Megatron and them just shake yeah, that Optimus, gets dark. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not going to be okay for them. They're like, but daddy, they were friends. And I'm like, yo, oh my God. Yeah. Oh, that scene rules. Yeah. Okay. That'll yeah. lead to one scene. Just, <laughs> that just kicks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and, you know, just another notch of Scarlett Johansson's belt for for looking like a badass now to her kids, so good for her. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm in, and it's kind of a interesting thing. And I was surprised because I, I dared myself. I put on my own secure helmet and went into the YouTube comments and was shocked by how positive this was, how many people just were like, I just wanted a Transformers movie with no humans, finally. I've got one. Like, <laughs> and like, yeah. Or we're just like, this is what I wanted. I Transformers are stupid and I love it and I want the cheese and this is it. Like, this is the snack I wanted. So I was surprised. And again, apparently, your old boy Kobe is just aging out. I'm becoming a grumpy old man. I've lived long enough to become the villain. But uh, yeah, no, but I, I'm just, I mean, but I wasn't against it. I, I thought it was, I was like, I'm not going to like this. And this first scene started. And then by the end, I was like, damn it, I'm already in. But Paramount Animation has been doing good. Like we said, check it out on that mountain of entertainment. They got Sonic. They got Ninja Turtles. Now we're getting this Transformers yep. thing. Whoever's up there, I might need to uh, wait. Get wait. Knuckles Ooh. soon? Wait, I got to go, go, go on the company. I got to go on the company website. Let's see about a job. Jobs out there. Paramount. So Janelle, uh, anyway, I know. So it won you over, right? Yeah, I mean, I I actually am like kicking myself for not watching this because this actually seems like something I would really, really like. And you guys know how I feel about animation in general. It's not like it's my true. favorite, but certain shows have really won me over. Like, I love What If. I love it. So um, I feel like this could be one that I chew on that I like a lot. Um, I, like, I'm just telling you, even just from the trailer, like I'm kicking myself for not even watching the trailer until now during our podcast. And I'm like, dang, this, this actually looks pretty impressive. Um, and especially if there's like humor and I just, I love like a little, I need like a lighthearted, like less serious, especially, okay. X-Men 97. I know we're going to get to it, but like that Ooh, is, boy. Is, it's heavy. Like it's so, you know, <laughs> This, is, I this feel like was this is a nice departure. This was by, and we'll get to it later, of course. But this was yeah. the first episode that Ember went. Uh, I'm scared, and I went, "Yeah, I'm gonna have to watch this one by myself." And so I watched oh. like the half of it because because yeah. it gets it gets dark, and I'm I'm amazed yeah. she made it through. I fast forwarded parts of the last one, okay? Because oh I no, I made it. my I son. Like, oh. I made my son come into the room. I was like, "Come into the room, <laughs> oh, see no. this party." I'm like, sit down for a minute. Because he started a fight with me about how the Avengers are harder than the X-Men. And I was like, bro, oh, you no. Seen, I was like, you've never seen the X-Men. You don't know what you're saying. You're five. And he started a legit fight with me. I was like, come in the room real quick. Okay. All right. That, okay. I, but he here, like, I agree with you on that. I understand the context. Yes, that matters. No, you can't. That is a, that is sacrilege. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> X-Men are trying to survive every day, bro. Tony starts having a drink. Calm down. <laughs> Like, they had yeah. to make their own island to to survive. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's yeah, let's put it in a in a perspective. Uh, so yeah, so anyway, Transformers, uh, really fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is great. This is an awesome episode. Uh, so far. That it. part where he runs away, we rewound three different times, and oh, I know well, I say well, rewound because yeah. I'm an oldie and I don't. I'm just so used to using VHS vernacular. I. Yes. <laughs> That's not what we did. We went 10 seconds back, but whatever. We watched that scene where he runs away because there's the big threat pops up and then he literally just bolts and doesn't say anything. We watched it like three different times. It's great. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I like that, like Ninja Turtles, just, just to conclude, like there seems to be actual comedic 
sensibilities behind this. Like it's not cheesy, funny. It's actually like funny, funny. And like, I, I really like that from the voice cast to just the writing. Um, it, it's legitimately funny. That's kind of what sold me on this. It was like, Oh, this is like a comedic transformers movie. Like, okay. Like uh, I'm kind of down with that. All right. Uh, Matt, you can only cook us another one of your favorite topics. So go for it. Oh yes. We got to talk. Do it. Kofi. Do it. The Witcher. There it is. I got to say that. It's a tradition. It's a tradition. Um, yes. So The Witcher season four and season five got a big update. Number one, we saw Liam Hemsworth not in costume as Geralt yet, but we saw him with the whole cast. They are starting production on season four starting now. Uh, no release date given for season four, but it was amazing. When you watch this video, it's amazing to see like Lawrence Fishburne's in the room. You forget that like we're getting Regis, we're getting Zoltan all in this season, and to see them all together, man, my I got I got I was so excited. Like I'm like the Rock over here getting goosebumps. Okay, it was it was awesome. Uh, and then the other big news was not only that season four is underway, but that season five is already greenlit and will be the final season of the series. Um, over the next over this season and season five, they are going to be essentially taking on the final three books. Uh, from the saga and it will be finding its conclusion uh you know no other release date kind of info was was given typically witcher hits in like you know holiday time typically a december release so i would say probably for season four probably next december if i had to give a guesstimate um but since they're just starting now but who knows maybe it'll be earlier um i i am very excited for this uh this is i'm also actually very excited that we're going to be that we have a plan and we've actually already announced that like the hey this is going to be our conclusion so i like that we have built this final arc i think it's a good call to end it with season five go out on the strong note take the best parts from the next three books and really hit hard with them and i um, you know i got fingers crossed for for liam uh here that we can step into that role and do some fun stuff so i am i'm feeling hopeful today and i and i'm excited to see what what they got cooking there oh all right yeah um i i always do like when we do get a controlled ending right it, it makes me feel better that like things are going to be kind of structured there's purpose and we know what we're doing there's no i feel like there's less chance of filler and just kind of delays and we're going to get just good content and get out of here. And, you know, that never means the end for the Witcher because they've already sprung this thing into a whole thing, right? Oh, so this yeah. Will be like, yeah, it'll just be like kind of the end of Geralt's story. I guess. Yeah, right. it'll be, well, it'll be the end of this particular, you know, essentially, I would be curious as to what, because the, they've made significant changes uh, to the books. Not as many as I feel like people make it out to be, but they've made some, some big changes, uh, to, to the story and character. So I, I'm curious to see how they close it out, but yeah, this saga essentially would be, would be done. Um, and so, you know, now I cannot remember Janelle, did you finish out? You finished out, right? Oh, chapter yeah. season three, chapter two. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, for sure. Okay. Big fan. How, of how are you feeling off. about Liam? Well, um, this this footage of the table read looks encouraging. Uh, everybody seems really, really happy and smitten. So that's good. Uh, I have not been the most optimistic, but I I'm so it's it's nothing follow. against Liam. It's me just right. being extremely loyal to whichever actors are placed in roles from the jump. And when they get rid of my favorite characters on shows, I tend to tune out. Or if they replace them with someone else, I tend to fall off. I mean, Walking Dead is a perfect example. I was probably the biggest fan you'll ever know. And then when they got rid of Glenn, I just kind of fizzled out. So um, I I don't know. I, I really like Cavill and I'm cautiously optimistic as i usually am but like i said this table read looks really encouraging if you guys haven't seen the footage you guys can find it um if you're just listening and you're not tuning in with us everybody's smiling and laughing and clapping you know and yeah that gives this me this cast 
is stacked yeah. for this season. And I think they yeah. were smart to do that because you are hitting the last three books and because yeah. they brought in two other fan favorite characters. I mean, I'm telling you, Regis and Zoltan are, are two yes. like beloved characters. So the fact that they're adding them to the group, I think they were smart. They've taken some of the pressure off of Liam having to carry so much of yeah. as Geralt, right? Because you still have Yennefer, Yaskir, you still have Siri, but Siri yeah. and Yennefer are gonna kind of be doing their own thing for a while. So I think okay. it was smart for them to bring in other characters to kind of add to the band and have totally. them him be able to play off of because that's when Geralt's at his best is when he has someone to play off of. So I think mm -hmm. they've made some smart decisions. We'll see. It will all come down to how you know the chemistry is and how Liam does in the role. Um, I feel but, bad but yeah, for I'm him. Very ex yeah, I really I'm, I'm feel very bad. Yeah, it's hard, actor. man. It's like number it's one, hard Miley to step Cyrus in. is crushing it. She yeah, I was about. I knew, oh, you! Flowers. I was gonna throw that shade if you didn't. Yeah, was about to throw <laughs> Miley Cyrus is having a moment. I'm walking. I'm walking through the woods, listening to when I used to be young. <laughs> you know, like yeah. It's, and it's... everybody's dogging on Liam. So like, I want this to be so good. I really want it to be awesome. Plus, like, I'm such a video game like adaptation lover in general. I feel like I don't always like not everybody knows that, but like I literally play video games for a job. So like aside from the podcast. So I whenever I see some of like the most brilliant video games getting turned into like projects and doing well, I get so excited. So this was just like I'm with you, Matt. I was so excited when this first came out. I was the biggest fan. I was like, oh my gosh, they're doing it. Like they're actually like giving honor to this game like there and and so you know a change is scary but i just yeah. like you know everybody's saying in the chat i feel like everybody's kind of like really wanting it to do well and yeah. i'm with y'all like we are we there, are one we're together on this <laughs> there, there's a perfect question that i think like uh, so eddie asks in the uh in the chat uh is the show is the show better version of or the game version which is which is better kind of yes oh, or no and that's and that's hard. the thing I can't say yes or no because there's elements of each that yeah. I prefer. Um, I agree. And and because it's based on the books and the games were lightly based on the books, but a lot of like additional canon has been added that like is kind of up to you to include or not with the games. The game yeah. like Witcher 3 and Witcher 2 is severely underrated, but Witcher 3 is like an iconic game at this point and its yeah. story is fantastic. But not all of it is... <laughs> is represented in the books. Um, and so like certain, they've taken certain things from, from both Yennefer people like, you know, you will get a, there, there's a, I know people love Yennefer in the games. Uh, I do not like the character at all. <laughs> I, I, that character <laughs> oh in the gosh. games sucks. Okay. In the, in the <laughs> books, I like her better. And in the, sh because the show took more from the books and the show also credit to Anya Shalatra, like, doing such a great job with Yennefer. Yennefer in the show is like nuanced and interesting and also has a lot of the same traits that she does in the games, but is not nearly as like, like she's just a, I think she's just a more interesting and better character. Yeah. So like Triss in the games is my favorite character, right? And I don't like her in the show. Mm. <laughs> so like there's, there's, it's split. And so I understand it. It's a hard question to answer. I can't, all that to say, I can't answer your question because uh, I'm very conflicted. So there you they're, go. They're, they're Sorry, I apologize. You gotta love yeah, them yeah. for their differences, but like <laughs> also just oh like, but they still did a good job of like uniting it, you know, making it seem like, at paying homage is how I say it, but yeah, we, gosh, for sure. Take so that energy hard. and move it on to Janelle's talk about another video game adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Janelle, call out for all my friends who have not um already binged the entire show. Um, and you're going, you're slow playing it like myself. Um, I'm only on episode two. I legit like this is like my one vacation of this entire year I took this week, and of course, it was when Fallout drops, which I'm I was just, I've been chomping at the bit for this to come out. And so we've been like watching it on our laptop, <laughs> like at a hotel trying to catch up, but we don't want to go through it too fast. But I so far am just mad about this show. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for this adaptation. I think they've done such a good job personally um, in episode two, I finally get to see the doggo, which makes me really excited. 
Um, and you know, I'm, I'm finally the, the first episode, it's hard to, you know, have an opinion on an entire series. If you just watch the first episode after episode two, I have definitely like chewed on it a little bit, gotten to know more characters. I get more world building and I'm so curious about like how they're, they're changing things up to get an actual storyline of the show when you have so much material to work with, with so many different games and like storylines. I'm really, I'm, I'm very impressed with how they're kind of threading it all together and making the story like interesting and wanting to know more about each character. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. Like I'm loving this. I, this is my show. I, I was really into the three body problem and now I'm really into fallout and I'm just, I'm really, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I'm liking shows this year. Right. You're going to have to host really our excited. sci-fi show. Yeah. 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 It's a good year for shows, man. It's good. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't and excited I, though at the beginning of the year. I didn't, I was like, Oh God, there's no Marvel shows. And now I'm like, I need the Marvel shows. So Yeah. Mm. I mean, okay. although Truth. we will get there, Marvel still is killing it on TV right now, still too. Popping. But um, still popping. Mm -hmm. But um, Fallout, I will say, uh, without spoilers, that one of the biggest things I was surprised about was how good of an overall seasonal story this was by the end, how it all wraps I up by the finale. That. And you're like, oh, Lee, like it actually, Jonathan Nolan is still good and company are still good at pulling off some twists. And yeah. Yeah making it all come together into a thematic and character and narrative point. One of the more well done kind of landing the planes I've seen in a long time and a hell of a finale episode. So fallout is still killing it. I'm on my second watch through because which oh. to the quality of this show is so much better when you know everything and you yeah. begin to watch through the second time and you actually, they did such a good job with it that when you watch through the second time, you can actually see certain things and be like, Oh Oh, oh, I cool. see. Like, yeah, you were, bro, you were sus from the beginning. I should have known when you did this out <laughs> of the other. Like, yeah. 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 Like, By the that, way, Janelle that, has inspired that was me not to real, also you know? do that. Yeah. What? Yeah. I, yeah. I am oh. also rewatching episodes so that I can have it, the episode we are talking about fresh in my head for when we're talking about it on a <laughs> weekly basis. And I agree uh, wholeheartedly with, with that. It's, it's as good. If not better, the second time through, I think it's yeah, uh, I think it's really so, good. I've been rewatching Shogun because my husband has now decided he wants to watch it, which I didn't think he was going to. So I, I've been watching it every single week, loyally, and now he's catching up, and I'm just watching it again because, as we all know, it's great. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I have to watch this twice because I'm yeah. backlogged because there's been so much to watch. But yeah, these I got to yeah. watch this last three episode arc again. Like it's been nuts. So let's just go right from there and just quickly touch on Shogun. We won't spoil too much um, because, like we said, a lot of people are still catching on to this. We're coming up on the finale, but um, man, episode oh, man. nine, I've been waiting to talk about because I read oh. the book. I read the book as a kid, and this is pretty. There are some key differences here. Um, the whole thing with Blackthorn and the seconding, I don't think that was in the book, uh, but much better in the show. Um, but I knew that turn was going to happen and it still was just gut wrenching as an, no, I'm not going to spoil. I'm not going to spoil, okay. but it was gut wrenching as an episode of TV to see it, even though I knew from the book, what was going to happen and everything. It was, it was beautiful and devastating. And the female centric episodes of this series have been like it, it's insane how good they are um there's this one because there's one this one that's just more focused about you know mariko and then there's the one that was focused on uh, ochiba nokata and and all that and so those two episodes have been stand out uh fujisama and all that like yeah the ladies have been killing it in this show and I, like I made the mistake of watching this in the middle of the night, and I was like, when it was done, I was like, I need a drink, but it was the middle of the night. So I was like, <laughs> we're not, I'm, I'm not there. I'm 42, bro. I might die You're if I do wrong. something like that. <laughs> yeah, I might do so. I might literally die if I do something like that nowadays. So I was just like, I gotta try to go back to sleep, and that wasn't successful. But oh man, and I wrote about this for uh, comicbook.com. I, I dissect this episode a little bit, and just kind of what I'm amazed by is how well Shogun earns everything that it pulls off when you go back and look at the series again and like literally everything everybody said, all the themes they've been discussing the whole time, all those conversation scenes, all of that, like preparing you for 
moves that got to be made, things like that are like unconscionable to us that we couldn't understand and having people do with, you know, duty and life and death and all that stuff is it's unreal. So um, I'm loving this. Anything you guys, I'm trying to be so careful right here. Like, yeah, I know I mean, I'm with you. I, I will just say like the whole time I'm not doing I just the whole time I was like, oh, sure. This is good. This it's this. I accepted it from the beginning. What what was going to happen? I was like, there's too many close calls going on. So, yeah. You knew duty. You were like, yeah, you know, duty. Yep. I got to. Yeah, yeah. I was like, there's no avoiding this. Like I was pretty much coming to terms with it the entire episode. I was just like, li just trying to like accept what, what we had in store. And I didn't know <laughs> I wasn't, I haven't read the books, but I was like, oh man, there's just no way. There's no way that everything's going to be hunky dory at the end of this episode. You are now prepared for parentage, you know, congratulations. <laughs> All right. Matt, I feel uh, like this anything? was our Game of Thrones episode. Like this felt so Game of Thrones e ish. Yeah, Matt, there were no helmets. For, no, there were quite a few helmets in this. Yes, there were actually were. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there yeah, were. There were. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, I want. I I think you guys said it really, really well. And mostly, I I I want to make sure we give time for X Men ninety seven. So I'll keep my I'll keep my comments short. But uh, this. The show is fantastic. I mean, I, I know it's early this year, but like to have three shows, the three, which is like the three we're about to, you know, we're talking about right now um, to have this kind of quality so early in the year is something else. Uh, this show is is I did not expect this show to really take me. Uh, and this is like appointment viewing for me every every week. I am up in the I'm middle of the night every this. week. Yeah, every week Absolutely. I'm up. Well, my yeah. my choice, my late night snack of choice is a rice cake, as opposed to uh, any sort of liquor uh, <laughs> or beverage. But, but I, but yes, a rice cake with peanut butter and banana, perhaps. So and I go. can't that's wait my, to get back on wine after this. That's my late night Shogun. Rewatch Shogun with some wine in hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm get uh, some samurai out of action. Meat. Yeah, I'm on a I'm cake. on a dry house system these days, and uh, I think uh, my late night snack is cereals. I'm back to like a kid again. I'm just I yes. eat late night cereal. Yeah, so Fruit Loops, but, um, Lucky Charms. Yeah, I'm sitting there. There's a hilarious thing on Reddit about <laughs> Apple Jacks. They changed the Apple Jacks logo. I did not know people were so serious about Apple Jacks and the potential <laughs> socio political implications of Apple Jacks. Go go down that wormhole if you really want to <sighs> really want to bug yourself oh out. God. All right, but like yeah, we got to use our time wisely here at the end. Um. Speaking of Marvel TV and things that can break you emotionally, X-Men 97, like who the hell knew this series? I was just like the most skeptical, like, oh God, why are we seeing this scene? That scene made me break emotionally. <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, mom, leaving your mom. <laughs> I was just like, uh, I was like, what? What? That was, just, And it's just like a moment. You're like, what? 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 And then more people dying um yeah x-men 97 follows this up and um you know I, I don't feel bad about this we could spoil this a little bit it's been out for a couple days and this is just a mild spoiler but we got you know we make this another surprising jump in this next episode it's not a complete follow-up to this harrowing episode with the kind of extermination of genosha we make a jump and it's the shiar empire uh for an xavier story but no matter how goofy the premise and comic booky, I mean, we had this an episode. We had Gladiator. There's a Vulcan yeah. sighting in the background. Like this is deep cut Marvel cosmic stuff. They still make it X Men '97 so serious for like adults in a kind of way. Um, from Deathbird dropping my favorite line of the week, which is Milky Way oh Ghetto, God. and yes, the that was horrible. The, the horrible racism against our planet. Um, and just the terms like. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people from a lot of minority communities that were just cracking up at this, and Black Twitter was hilarious because they were like, oh, finally other people see how it feels now when it's like the whole planet and somebody else talking like this about you? Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little rough when you get when the whole Earth, when everybody on Earth gets thrown into these comments like that, like we're all just trash. But it has messed with me, I'm not going to lie to you. X-Men's got me effed up out here, like, really wondering. I'm really wondering if Earth isn't the smelly kid in the, go in the, in the cosmos. Like, <laughs> I feel like it's increasing evidence. And we had that report, right? That was, like, recent, that there might be a galactic coalition and we're just, like, the people they want to avoid. And that's why we never see anybody, because we're, like, a quarantine world, because we're too dangerous. And, like, I'm beginning to feel that way. <laughs> like, X-Men's got me out here feeling some kind of way. 
Although uh, me and my little brother do have a hilarious uh, thread on Facebook and one of the fandom things about what are anti, what are ra- as humans, what are we going to come up with with for racial terms for bird alien people? Um, and there's some hilarious suggestions in that thread. <laughs> Tim An old Burns. country for for old country racism. I think we're going with hollow bones. Them old hollow bones. Yeah, Deathbird like, yeah. is unintentionally hilarious in this episode. Like she has a couple lines. Like there's a couple a couple lines. The uh, thinking the quiet part out loud exchange was another great exchange. Like I did not see like Deathbird hitting that hard. <laughs> <laughs> she came in but that was that was fantastic yeah um her most serious weapon is her forked tongue yeah there was something about <laughs> us being apes too i was like man i was like this sounds lot. so racist like i know it's just like a comic book thing but like it sounds real personal yeah this was uh this was hard man like especially after the last episode hitting just wrecking uh everyone and then for this one, this was a little bit of a. I did love Brywood's comment about Ronan getting cooked and everything. <laughs> everything is great. It's a great comment. Also, I'll see. Thank you, Jay, for the for the compliments on the hair. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I just think like it was. There's a little bit of like nerd. Uh, <laughs> like I just love seeing so many characters that like I didn't really think I'd see. I mean, aside from not seeing the Star Jammers. Like, I really like seeing Gladiator, seeing so many, seeing Landra, seeing all these characters pop up and seeing that whole side of the story told. I really didn't see that coming, at least not this early. Um, And then once you like, you know, you're kind of like watching this, you know, drama, right? It, it's very much like the soap opera side and the po- politics side. And then you go to the Stormforge stuff and that's like creepy. There's some creepy scenes. They they did that extremely Ugh. effectively, but man, what a Ugh. but what a payoff! Like and without like getting into like spoiling that entire thing, like the way that plays out and seeing like a really earned moment that was awesome. Like that. No, that we gotta whole address last that half real quick. Though. We gotta address that real quick. Okay, people... so do we want to spoil it then? Yeah, we gotta address something because some I retweeted okay. this, but people. Like, people are bugging, bro. Like, man, at least we were just cooler in the 90s about stuff because people are bugging about Storm's costume moment, right? And they're like, how did... And there's this big debate online about how did she make this costume? Bro, this entire series starts in a mall. And when they save Jubilee, the first thing Storm does is put her hands to the sky and yes, lightning on her costume over her civilian costume. Yes. And you know what we did in the que- in the 90s? Because we were still smart as a nation back then. We didn't ask questions. We just questioned. we said nothing. We said, nothing. oh, that's cool. <laughs> cool. Exactly. That was cool. Look at Storm. She's got the, whatever we called fit on back then. And then that's like, yeah, so we went true. Now everybody's on Twitter debating who cares. Storm's a witch in the comics now. Like Storm can do anything. So Storm made it. It was outfit. that's so true. I didn't even think about that. That is so I also oh, do love what version of the costume it is. Oh, I yeah. love I Giant love that we got ball. like that transformation. Yeah, that's great. So good. Yeah. So all right. Uh, I freaked out about Janelle. That now. What are, what are you thinking about this one? I mean, it's just so intense. Uh, it like very much. I, I can't believe this is an animated show, and it's getting kind of the emotional responses that I'm feeling um, from it. I'm just, I'm kind of blown away, and this has sort of made me rethink the way that I look at animated shows in general. Really, going forward, um, this might be the thing that actually sends me into watching more anime, like giving anime another chance. I I mean, it is, this has blown my mind so far. I mean, this is the show that I watch first, like out of all of the shows that drop weekly. Yeah, it's climbing up there. Yep, this is my first one that I go for. And then I'll watch Shogun when I need to sit down and read everything. (laughs) Yeah, I'm getting like- I'm uh, with you. This is the one I look forward to most. I'm like, yeah. everybody leave me alone. I got to watch my stories. It's my stories about the mutants. <laughs> Let's turn them on. It's such a sleeper hit. Like, it was not expected at all for me. I was like, oh, man. All right. I'm going to watch. It's X-Men and it's animated. Here we go. Strapping myself in, ready to go. And then it just, it's blown me away. And I am 
I'm just like, I'm an X-Men fan. Like, this is yeah. just really, really cool. Although I cannot stand Rogue's accent. She sounds like Dolly Parton. It drives me nuts. I also got to say, we aren't given enough credit. We haven't done a good enough job on this show of saying, like, um, yeah, definitely as, uh, oh, man, as... Hamez 5000 says in the in the comments um yeah uh, Disney Plus is cooking oh, on yeah. Wednesdays now with a double hit I get to watch X-Men then I get to watch Bad Batch and it's like good Marvel animation good Star Wars animation it's keeping me on Disney Plus every Wednesday so good job Big Bob you you're doing it um but yeah Bad Batch is still cooking and coming down to its last two episodes and yeah we don't talk about that as much on here because it's more of a cult following audience but like yeah, Bad Batch is up there with Rebels for me as Star Wars animation that is going to be probably discovered later on, but has been cooking really hard on like that and or kind of level for for some time. So, yeah, yeah, we love uh, we love some Bad Batch and uh, Rich is in the comments. I think that's Rich over there. <laughs> saying, Thanks for the love from Bad Batch. No, man, we don't say it enough, but the two the double hit of X-Men 97 and Bad Batch on a Disney plus one two every wednesday is is it's giving me life man like it's giving me life so thanks chanel that was a good uh that's a good point out matt you wanna you wanna close this out here you got some things on your agenda yeah so real quick i want to um give some love to a movie that's actually in theaters today uh it's a special kind of one day uh only feature uh, and it was actually done uh that part was raised on kickstarter uh is a really fun kind of dark comedy called villains inc uh, it is featuring uh, Colin Mockery, uh, whose line is in any way fame, uh, Mallory Everton, uh, Jason Gray and Billy Mann. Uh, and this is literally about it, it's it's supremely fun. It's essentially if uh, all about the henchmen that work for a supervillain and what happens when the supervillain accidentally dies and how do they like live their lives? Because they've literally come to like depend on the villain kind of running things and like, where's the money coming from? Where's the thing coming from? And then they find themselves. Uh, and by the way, the villain dies in a hilarious way. Uh, but how do they just like live life? And it's just these three characters just kind of trying to make it, you know, there's like a temp agency for, for villains and filling that role and what odd jobs do they take? Uh, and, and it's just, it's hilarious. Like there's just really fun. It's almost like, and they kind of, we have an interview, uh, with them uh, on the site right now. And and they kind of compared it to like, you know, a, like if you mix the boys with a Wes Anderson film, that's the vibe. It's like that kind of like the dark side of, of things, but also just the finding the lightheartedness in it all. And then kind of with that almost indie movie feel really fun. Uh, it'll, you know, I'm sure it'll be on video demand uh, soon as well. But right now, today, it actually has a, a special theatrical thing. So uh, very much, if you want to check out that full interview, you can. Just wanted to give it some love. And then moving into this weekend is AEW Dynasty. Uh, this is the first pay-per-view for AEW since kind of their big three uh, debuts, their big three signings. Uh, they have Okada, uh, William Ospreay, and Mercedes Monet. And, and they've, you know, some of them have been signed for longer. They've been featured on TV, but this is really the first pay-per-view where all of them are either have a match or playing a significant part uh, in a storyline going into it. Uh, so this is a big, you know, this is a big pay-per-view uh, for AEW. And there are some, obviously there are some titles on the line, uh, but there's really like the opportunity for kind of new eras, new championship reigns to begin. Uh, you know, some of them, I, I don't know if we'll actually see champ switches, but that one right there, Samoa Joe versus Swerve Strickland. If Charlie Ridgely were here, uh, he'd be very much in the, the era of Swerve probably begins here. And for me, it absolutely should. This is the, this is the, the real like perfect opportunity. Swerve Strickland has become as popular as ever in AEW. He's gone through kind of the trials and tribulations as it were. And now it's time for like him to run with the ball. And I think it's, it's time for him to be world champ. Uh, so I think that's one of the, if you know, none of the other, I don't know if Julia Hart loses to, to Willow Nightingale, even though it's because it's probably going to involve Mercedes, which one of the kind of other big takeaways is that Mercedes, you know, from she's ex like prominently featured on AEW TV. They have made her the kind of represented her as the big star she is on TV. She's a focus, but 
she doesn't actually have, she hasn't wrestled yet and she doesn't have a match until double or nothing. So like, it's going to be a full, like two months before she actually has a match in the ring. She's, she's in storylines, you know, interactive with people, promos, all that stuff, but she hasn't had a match and she won't have a match here either because she faces whoever wins between Julia Hart and Willow Nightingale. So it is an interesting decision to kind of keep her out of the ring um until that time it is an interesting strategy i don't you know i'm kind of mixed on it uh because of course i would love to see her in the ring sooner but she will have some sort of part to play here because she faces whoever wins here um so i i think uh, i don't think okada loses um but there are going to be some great matches here osprey versus uh brian danielson is going to be a great one uh okada versus pack is going to be a great one like there's going to joey hart versus nightingale is going to be great uh there's going to be some good stuff here so uh it is going to be sunday night uh, of course our our team at comic book will have all the coverage on everything that's happening throughout uh but let us know what you think uh let us know what you think on on twitters and threads and all that stuff about um what's happening in AEW, the event itself and what you kind of want to see from these new big three shout out for awesome puns in the comments <laughs> all right that'll do it for this episode of comic book nation we have done the thing talking about rebel moon part two the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare abigail Transformers won after its new trailer. What's going on with The Witcher? We checked in with TV with Fallout, X-Men 97, Shogun, and Matt's agenda included Villains, Inc., and a breakdown of what's going on in AEW before their Dynasty event. Go back and listen to anything you missed. We will miss you guys for a week. We will be back again next Friday with our live show, but that's not all we do. Comic Book Nation is an entire nation of shows. <laughs> So during the week, you can catch our hot new anime segment, Anime Initiative, every Tuesday. On Wednesdays, Maddie digs in the crates of new comics and tells you what the big publishers and the indie publishers are putting out that's worth your time in the pull list. Every Thursday, our quick save segment breaks down what's happening in the gaming world for you. And on Friday, you're back with us in the live show where we do it all and kind of keep you up to date with what's going on in geek culture. And in the midst of all that, we drop bonus episodes and recaps and all kinds of other stuff. There's interviews on the Comic Book Nation YouTube page. And special community announcement, if you are one of our YouTube viewers, Eddie, don't leave yet. We are going to be going back over to our Comic Book Nation YouTube page. Uh, I think we've become official enough now that they're like, yeah, we're going to try to make this a thing. So we're going to be over on the Comic Book Nation YouTube page again, where we will be kind of growing the show over there and hosting our live shows every week over there. So be sure to keep an eye out if you are one of our YouTube viewers of the live show. It's just comic book with nation at the end. We'll be over there. All right, Matt, Janelle, thank you guys, as always, for stepping in. Everybody have a great week in geek culture. See a good movie, watch a great TV show, and read a good comic because <laughs> we got all three right now. We're cooking. See you guys next week. We are Comic Book Nation. Peace. This is... <laughs>